G'day legends, welcome back to the Sports Medicine Project. Now, if you wanna jump straight to Dr. George Kalar and hear all about orthopedics over in the US, skip to around 14 minutes. If you wanna hear Kelly and I discuss her return to running after a femoral stress reaction at three and a half weeks, listen to the first parts. It's uh, pretty interesting, some good discussion. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of the Sports Medicine Project, number 80-something with Dr. George Kalar, part two with him. Part one was last week, part two is this week. Welcome to my co-host, Kelly Cortic, about to be a, a revelation medical case, and we're going to talk about why, because she is about to defy all the odds. <laughs> All the medical advice, anything <laughs> logical. She's going straight off the balcony. She's going to get back running after a femoral stress reaction in a record four weeks. Those professional athletes, I don't know what they're doing. They haven't spoken to Kelly. No. Okay. 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 Let me justify. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is your podcast. So thanks for coming back on for another episode. <laughs> You're welcome. So let me justify myself. So we had a discussion with quite a few sports physicians on Thursday evening and my MRI got pulled up onto the screen as well as a musculoskeletal radiologist and the general consensus was that it was a on the Fredrickson scale a grade one so a lot of the bony edema was probably more a chronic effect of a high training load and lots of running Mm. whereas the the symptomatic region was largely just the periosteal reaction. So that would be classified as a grade one on the Fredericks scale of bone stress injuries. Yes. Now for context, if you are a new here, Kelly recently was diagnosed via clinical symptoms and MRI with a pretty extensive 31 centimeters. 38 centimeters. 38 centimeters femoral stress reaction, quite a significant amount of bony edema through the bone, which would be in the in the trabecular part. Well, it wasn't then, really... Well, I, maybe some of it was like a, apparently up towards the femoral neck, but there wasn't yeah. a localized region of bony edema. What it was about, quite diffuse. About a couple of centimeters below the neck there was. When we were concerned that, that we thought that could have been a stress fracture. Nah, that was down further. So what about that part? I don't know. I think that was just diffuse. Would you say that's... I don't remember what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's what we were concerned. That's why you got a, a CT. We were concerned that that was a, a stress fracture. So there was... On the mid shaft. Yeah. So yeah. so mid shaft, that was periosteal reaction. All right. Okay. So you're saying across the bone, we'll put the images up on, on socials. Anyway, on the outside of the bone, periosteum, there was quite a bit of fluid as well. So your, your logical thinking here. Well, it's not just logical thinking. It's based on Stuart Warden's paper on management of bone stress injuries. It's a low risk area and it's yeah, his recommendation is once you're symptom, um, free of symptoms with ADLs and able to walk for 30 minutes, then you can be uh, for a week, mm. then you can begin a gradual running return to running program. Yeah. So I'm I'm coming from the point where I'm against it, mm. but happy to support you with whatever you do. It's your own own body. I'm trying to make the case for not doing it. So my argument in that context is that from what we understand about bone turnover, it takes a certain amount of time for It bone takes 18 to... months. So that then you could argue that it should, I should really be waiting 18 months to begin... Re- Right. No, you can't. That's just a straw man. You can't just say, oh, well, it takes 80 months, so I should wait 80 months. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that I don't think in that short period of time where you haven't been running, that is enough to have the area repaired to then go back and run again. Now, I did say that I believe that you would be able to do it, but I don't know how much closer that brings you to the threshold of having another one. So let's say, for argument's sake, it's eight right? And they're just trying to do it on a scale. Eight is where you get a stress reaction. When you're starting this return to running earlier, perhaps you're starting at six. So you're closer to eight. Whereas if you wait the six weeks or eight weeks, you'd be starting from two. That that graph means nothing. It's just so you can understand where I'm, where I'm coming from. So that's my why I don't think you should should do it. But in saying that, like you said, there's some periosteal 
it's really just like dye splints. So we're yeah, it's to like treating people. medial tibial stress syndrome. We spoke about this on the Patreon episode not yeah. long ago. Yeah. Where if someone is dealing with a periosteal reaction or MTSS, then continuing to run is is actually quite safe and a, a good idea. Yeah, and that was the saying in the 80s and 90s, they used to diagnose people with thigh splints. So where the adductor muscles come across, it's a periosteal, you know, whether it be compressive or irritation or whatever, and mm. you can manage it like a soft tissue injury. But the difference there, but then again on your side actually, because we've posted about numerous studies where people with MTSS do have bony edema through their shins anyway, if, if you're a runner, and we see that with people training for marathons up to six months after a marathon, you can have some bony edema yeah, in your feet and ankles. asymptomatic. However, you have bony edema with clinical symptoms, or we, we, you had clinical symptoms where you had pain to hop, you had pain non weight bearing, and it correlated to where you had the edema. But it didn't because I didn't have pain the whole entire length of my thigh. No, I had pain around no, right, the yeah. region where there was periosteal edema on the MRI. I didn't have any pain. I didn't have widespread pain mm. that extended through my entire thigh. Yeah, that's true. That is true. But you still had discomfort and pain. Yeah, and so, I, I'm not doing anything reckless. Like, I'm completely pain-free. I've, I've been pain-free for a week and a half. Mm. I can do 20 hops without any problems i can squat mm. i've been walking doing like i can walk for over 60 minutes without any mm. pain or discomfort so the other the other argument i have is you have an increase of stress injuries because one you're female you're an endurance athlete you've had bone stress injuries in the past and you've had hormonal things in the past which we've spoken about on the podcast so all those things increase your risk of having a bone stress injury and you have a bone stress injury, or we think you do, again, can we decipher whether that bone edema in the actual femur is the driver of the symptoms or that's just an inconsequential finding? I guess it comes down to are you willing to take the risk and say that it is or it isn't and what's the potential gain? Well, if you so say you had a, a patient who is coming back from a bone stress injury. Yes. Let's say they've had the six weeks off and you're doing a gradual return to running program and they get through a week's worth of gradual return to running and then they start to experience symptoms. What would you do? I would give them three days off. So if so, yeah, sorry, keep going. Oh yeah. I'd give them three days off and then tell them to do the session before the one, say if it was, They'd gone to one thirty run, four minute walk. I'd go, oh, I'd do one minute run, four minute walk, and see how that feels. So they didn't just fracture their their bone by experiencing symptoms. They, no. You were able to deload it. Well, it, it depends on the severity of the injury. If they had a stress fracture, it would probably be a little bit different. I might be more aggressive with like, no, we need to have more time off depending on where it is as well. And there's other factors like what they do throughout the day. So let's say in your case of a femur, if that happened and it was a stress reaction, I'd be pretty okay with them just having three days off and then doing the session that flared them up or the one before that and then progressing from there. Mm. But So what's the difference now? Yes, yeah, so, so in the back of my mind, I know that they've had extra time off. So I'm more confident. I'm like, oh, this can just be whether you have it run for a while or it's just something different or you do have a little bit of localized periosteum, that's okay. But I'm more confident because I know you've had this time off and I can be a little bit more confident that your bone is stronger because I'm not worried like you you think of your bone could be weaker unless they're going to fracture it but it, it could be it could be weaker does that not concern you at all like your bone could be more fragile and you might get back to four weeks five weeks six weeks and as i was saying before you don't know on a cellular level how close you are to the threshold up until you ran that park run pb you were the fittest you've ever been going so well and then one day later it's all gone to crap that's my concern so you mm, could, see, I don't even know if it has no, though. Like again, I, I, I still think that it was more a, a, a periosteal reaction and the edema might have just been a incidental finding. So yeah. I don't know that it's periosteal to just would you if when you see shin splints, do people say they usually get a little bit of discomfort and then it slowly comes on and comes on? So let's think of like Well it did though. Like think about my my long run on the Sunday. I ran twenty eight kilometers pain free. You wouldn't like, again, like we were talking about this on the podcast, like that's quite unusual of a, a true bone stress injury. Yeah. If, if someone was to have shin splints, 
the way that I've heard it reported is that they they notice a little bit of discomfort. Like initially it might start with, yeah, I just notice it just at the start of the run and then it goes away. And then they start to notice it more and more and more where it's like, yeah, now I notice it more in my run, now I notice the whole run, then I have to reduce my run and it gradually builds up. Whereas for you, like on that Saturday, you had pain straight away. Just come on. Or just come no. on, sorry, after park run. Mm. Like, and then you had pain all that afternoon and you had pain the next morning. But that's not unusual of MTSS either or shin splints. Isn't it? No. Oh, okay. I would see that. All right. Maybe I'm just... I haven't seen it. I just usually hear someone say, like, you know, it gets sore and sore and sore and sore. Not like it's sore and then it stays sore. Mm. Again, like, I don't think I'm going to... I'm not doing anything, like, reckless here. And to be honest, I, I don't think I would recommend this to a patient. But... Well, maybe I would. I don't know. But... <laughs> I wouldn't rec- I couldn't recommend it. I wouldn't that. recommend it to a patient if the sports doctor had said something yeah. different. And I guess you can do what you can please. And like you That's said, you it. Like I think I've safe. just made a decision that I'm just going to try it and see how it goes. Yeah. And People listening to this I'm, probably think you're trying to qualify for Paris. Well, that's, and that's the other thing. Like I'm not in any rush to build up my, my running quickly. So I'm quite happy to jog along at six minute Ks. Mm. The reason that I want to start running again is because I don't particularly like bike riding. And I don't see the big risk in starting my return to running now based off all the information we have. I've done all the blood tests. They've all been normal. I've, my eating's fine. Like I, I, I think I have low risk at the moment and it's a low risk area. So I think I can treat it based off the, I think it's 2020 or 2019 Stuart Warden paper where he recommends once you've had a week of symptoms, being low or free Great. then you can begin your return to running like that's exactly what i'm doing i'm just following his recommendation really and what happens if it flares up with one run what will you do i'll, I'll deload it by how like will you stop running or you take three days off depends i don't know i won't run through pain like if it starts to become uncomfortable at any of the intervals then i'll stop so let's say it becomes sore what are you going to do so you, you get soreness, you're your third run in, you're on your third interval set and you get pain. What do you do? Stop running, walk. And then what do you do after that? Do you just stop and give it two weeks? I deload it and wait till I become completely symptom free, however long that takes. And then I would com- I'll do what I would recommend to a patient. I'd complete the last interval that I completed without symptoms. All right, last two questions. Yeah. Let's say that you, third interval, you, you, it gets sore, you stop. You, you wait for your symptoms to go away. They go away for three days. You go to do it again and it's sore again. Then what do you do? I'd have longer off, so, I suppose. And then you just keep having a longer off until you can get to no pain. I guess so. Yeah. I just don't think that's going to happen though. Okay. I'm just saying if, if it does and then if it did. But I wouldn't make that decision on my own. Like none of this has been me making a decision on my own. Like I trust Nikki so much as a clinician and as mm. a person and this is her recommendation as well that I can begin running. So this is not just me. <laughs> Throw her under the bus. Just blame her. No, I'm not no, throwing her under the bus. Like she would back that as well. I, yeah. And I, I will make decisions in conjunction with another clinician because I don't think it's a good idea to try and treat yourself necessarily. Oh, yeah, I it's, agree. I'm the person that's making the final decision because it's my, my leg. But <laughs> I'm... Fair. My favorite, consulting my with other physios about if it's a good idea or not to. Yeah, nice. Well, I, I, it'll be interesting. I think it, it'll be fine. I'm just trying to play as much of the other side as possible. And because obviously I don't want you to miss lots of running from a mm. sore femur. Yeah. But uh, maybe then you just it. start hitting everyone with thigh splints. Maybe the people can start getting metatarsal splints. Maybe. I'm like, oh yeah, it's just your Dr. Halusa. If you've run through that. Stress thing. fractures aren't even a real thing, are <laughs> yeah. really. Everything is just something splint. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, enjoy part two with Dr. George Collard. Use any injectables or bone stimulators or also biologics with people with, with these injuries if they have any kind of bone compromisation like osteoporosis or, or even just for the, the general active sporting population without those? Yeah, we usually don't. We send them to the endocrinologist to make sure that the vitamin D, calcium levels, um, it's all good. And then uh, try to understand from a 
you know, what can they do to bring those levels up uh, just prophylactically? But uh, I think, you know, from a stress fracture perspective, in the short term, in six weeks, uh, a normal balanced diet and offloading the, the, the bone is potentially the best that you can do. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, this this is my probably one of my, my favorite topics to talk about, probably because we get the the most questions about this whenever we have a guest on the podcast to, to this standard, talking about the blanket term of injectables for both the hip and the knee. In Australia, it's mostly PRP and cortisone and, and synviscin, and that's a sports physician, sports doctor, or orthopedic surgeon that's, that's recommending them. What, what do you see clinically to be effective? Because the research is, is kind of all over the place where this is no better than a placebo, but then this works better than this injection. And then there was another study that came out recently that showed just injecting saline into an osteoarthritic knee was no better than doing a, a fully exercise program. So it, it's kind of all over the place. What do you see kind of clinically and, and what kind of goes into your considerations when thinking about injectables for both uh, knee and hip? That's a good question. Um, you know, there's multiple things that go into my mind. One is the effectiveness. Uh, second, uh, you know, the time frame, and third is the price. So, for the most part, uh, we we use cortisone injections for people that come with an acute flare-up because it's uh, readily available. It's approved by insurance. Um, you know, it can be extremely effective, although not long-lasting. But for people that have an inflammatory issue, I think it's a very good therapy. If you have degenerative disease and you have significant osteoarthritis, a cortisone injection most likely than not will be a band-aid, right? Because you have not stopped the process and um, you will have to repeat this in time. And I just don't like to do it more than two times in a lifetime. In a lifetime. So I try to keep it as uh, restrictive as possible. We've studied, uh, you know, as part of uh, the non-surgical uh, treatment of osteoarthritis um, panel here when we did the, the clinical practice guidelines for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. So we looked at, into all of these in, in, in very uh, in, in a lot of detail. And what we found was that for gel injections, which is the same VISC uh, and others, um, the number needed to treat, which is a statistical measure that tells you how many people you need to treat to have one meaningful clinical difference was 16 to 17 which means you need to treat 17 people to get one meaningful oh. clinical difference. It's not oh. as effective, right? Although yeah. it may last for longer, it's not as effective as we thought. Finally, for PRP or platelet-rich plasma, the only concern is that it's, at least in the States, not covered by insurance. So, uh, you know, some people may not uh, want to do it because of uh, financial reasons, and, and we're sensitive of that and, and don't indicate it on everybody just because of that reason. But... When you look at the outcomes, most of them, you know, there's at least 30 randomized clinical trials have shown to be better than the counterparts, and that's uh, gel, cortisone, placebo, and so forth. You also mentioned something important, which is sometimes saline can have a, a potential effect. There's uh, one study done by my partner, Brian Cole, where he actually looked at saline as a, as a you know, placebo type of treatment, and it's actually not placebo because you can change uh, some of the components and the pH and 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 the you know the cellularity of the knee synovial fluid, and uh, that can actually be beneficial. So saline may not be a good placebo because it, it actually has good therapeutic power as well. It's not uh, as durable, I may say, but but it can have a short term um, you know uh, alleviation of the symptoms, if you will. Yeah, and I wanted to, that's a great point you raised. I wanted to ask you that question again in a bit bit more detail with the saline, like it, and that's a bit of a question, like is it more fluid in the knee? Is there an active ingredient? And we're comparing it to PRP and cortisone where it's not just a, a nothing injection, like you're not injecting nothing, you're certainly injecting something. So is it to do with, with the fluid and the changes of the pH? I, I think so. You know, it has to do with, uh, with fluid. I think it has to do there's also a, a big psychological component when you get an injection, right? Mm. So uh, there is a placebo effect of just having your knees injected and, and or thinking you may have, you know, when you do a double-blind randomized trial, they think that they may be, may be getting the biological therapy as well. So I think there's a myriad of components here. We we certainly know that it's it's not a zero effect, but you, when you compare saline to PRP, you, you know that PRP 
can be more effective and more long lasting as well. So I'm not saying that people that you know should use sailing as a treatment option because we have other options that are maybe more beneficial and, and proven to be uh, more successful than sailing can be. Yeah, and for, for PRP, is that that multiple ejections two to four weeks apart? How what's the general kind of protocol? Uh, we did a, a study that is published on JBJS looking at is there a standardized protocol to PRP and there's not such things. Everybody does it a different way. Mm-hmm. Not even on how to prepare it, how many um, times you use centrifuge and at which speed, or how many RPMs and at the time. We just don't know. You know, Everybody does it a different way. I think if you follow the principles, you should be okay regardless. And those are, you want to at least have uh, two uh, centrifugation processes and then uh, if you want to inject in the joint, I think most people would agree that you want to look at poor PRP. So that means that you shouldn't get too close to the red cell blood layer because you will get more uh, more leukocytes and potentially cause more, more inflammation. So you want to do a leukocyte poor type of PRP. And um, I usually do it uh, in, in a series. You know, we know that in multiple studies, multiple injections are better than just one. Uh, and they range from three to five. We usually tend to do three uh, one week apart. Yeah, yeah, okay. And with with the the access to them, is it so they don't cover PRP? That's that's purely out of out of pocket for that in the states. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And do you do you see anything in the future in the next kind of five or ten years from an injection point of view that hasn't really come to to mainstream marketing? Because I imagine. Clinical trials, it has to be approved, FDA and all that kind of thing. And then you guys usually get those things first and then it comes to, to Australia. Is there anything that's kind of on the the forefront or on the horizon for injectables for osteo, osteoarthritic knees or hips or anything like that? Yeah, I do think so. You know, I think that uh, we've been uh, doing this shotgun approach, right? We use yeah. the same PRP, <laughs> us, uh, cartilage uh, deficiency, ACL tears, rotator cuff tears. So it, it certainly can't be, it's not a magical compound, right? So it's not that it will heal absolutely everything and everywhere. There's things that are not beneficial for some tissues. You know, you have T, TGF beta 1, uh, which is not beneficial for muscle healing because that can cause more fibrosis. You have VEGF, which is not uh, conducive of cartilage repair. And all those things are present in the PRP every single time. So uh, I think although we're injecting some things that are good, we're also injecting things that are not very good. So I think in the future, we will get more granular, just like, you know, our rheumatological um, partners have done. And, and, you know, when you have a disease, they, they treat it with a very specific monoclonal antibody, right, that it's targeted to that specific disease. I think at some point we will be able to measure is this, you know, just like you do for diabetes, right? We have those uh, strips, maybe get a little bit of synovial fluid and say, okay, what is this? Is this uh, an inflammatory issue? Is this a degenerative issue? Is this whatever that might be? And then just treat it accordingly based on, on what the problem is. I think a, a big part of what we don't know is what are we treating? You know, when we see somebody that has uh, moderate arthritis, is that uh, inflammation that we're treating or is that, you know, degenerative disease? They may have CTX2, which is uh, a degradation component of cartilage. So if that is the case, then you know, you may want to do something different than if it's just inflammation. So I think we just need to get more, get more granular with what are we treating first, so diagnosing what are we treating, and then potentially getting more and more specific with the things that we inject. may not be PRP, maybe just a couple of growth factors that we know are good for that specific reason. Yeah, and much more tailoring the, the approach. Correct. Over in, in the States, I wanted to ask, and this is a question that, that come through from a, a first year physiotherapy student. They had said they've had multiple patients tell them that their, their doctor, whether it be their general practitioner or even orthopedic surgeon had said, you need to wait as long as you can until you get a knee or a hip replacement, basically until you can't stand the pain anymore because they don't last very long. Is there any truth to this? Because I looked up a, a quick systematic review and there was some some studies to say on average, most for 58% of patients, they last around 25 years. And I was assuming that that these don't wear out in five to 10 years. If it's painful, you know, and the option is there, it's a good option to, to get them replaced. Can you speak much to that? 
Yeah, I think the paradigm has changed a little bit. And although I'm not a replacement surgeon, uh, we know that they can be even outpatient procedures these days, right? So uh, we usually tend to tell patients, uh, just get it done whenever you feel that uh, your function is limited enough that you're unsatisfied or you're not able to do the things you love to do. Mm. Because there's a big thing to, you know, there's something to be said about atrophy and having those people stop doing the things that they love to do and stop being active can cause other things that are maybe more difficult to treat, such as cardiovascular disease or, 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 or others, right? So I think it's important to keep them active. That's our job. Um, and, and try to keep them doing whatever they want to do and, and keep them fulfilled and, and, and being able to, to practice sports. And if in, in 20 years from now and 15 years from now, whatever that might be, the prosthesis needs to be changed, they at least got 15 years out of it that were happy that in which they were able to do whatever they wanted to do, in which uh, they prevented potentially cardiovascular disease by, by continuing to be active. So I think the power of them is shift now, and I think it's not um, a, a good indication now to say just keep going until you can't go any further. I say whenever you you can't do the, the things you love to do and, and you feel frustrated with the current condition, I think that's the time to do it. Yeah. Of course, you wouldn't do it as a first line of treatment, but, you know, after you've tried uh, you know, a physical therapy and uh, potentially injections to try to mitigate the pain, if that continues to be an issue, I think it's a good option. Hmm. What do you you see the, the biggest mistake physical therapists and rehab specialists make when managing, managing these conditions and kind of referring on to, to orthopedics? Um, you know, I, I honestly think that uh, physical therapists uh, have a, a major role in, in the treatment of these patients. And I, I think they're sometimes less aggressive with this in, in the sense of, you know, some, some surgeons are too aggressive with surgery, which is not a good thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes seeing a physical therapist before to improve your mechanics, your range of motion, you know, how you run, for example, how you do things is potentially a very good first step, I, I rarely see anything bad happen from from an initial evaluation, initial treatment. Actually, I do think it's potentially better because if, I would say that most people improve and the ones that don't are the ones that should see us uh, so we don't overburden the system. So I, I do think that it's potentially a, a very good thing to do. Are there any triggers that you teach physical therapists or, or anyone that would possibly refer to you to think about when referring on to orthopedics? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Is is there any kind of considerations that you teach people that would potentially refer to you or, or chat to you about their patients to think about when they are going to refer someone on? Like the the question would, I guess the scenario would be if you're, you know, with your patient going through physical therapy and, and getting to a point where things aren't improving the way that they might be expected or, or think that they should when to then refer on, on to you. Do you have any kind of ways that people can think about that? They go, great, you've, you've done enough. You need to go and see the orthopedic surgeon. I think I think that's time now. I think that's a good question, but th that has to do with that uh, sense from the physical therapist as to what that patient wants, right? We, we tend to practice a medicine that is more like heart these days. And uh, whatever you know, patients want is what we try to do so that they remain satisfied. So sometimes, you know, if that patient don't want don't want to have surgery because of uh, A, B, or Z, right, or they're getting married, or or they they have a trip planned and things of that nature, I think it's okay to continue uh, uh, to try it as much as they want to. But you know, you can sense the frustration of patients when things are not going well. I think when when that is the case and and you don't see any improvement and they are plateaued, that's the time to refer to an orthopedic surgeon for a consultation and. Also, to offload you from from the responsibility of potentially something happened that may not improve with non-surgical treatment. Yeah, what's the the longest surgery? This is another listening question. What's the longest surgery that you you performed? I think it was, uh, you know, as an attendee, I performed one in spine that I absolutely hated for about uh, twelve hours, uh, which made me doubt about my interest in orthopedics. But uh, <laughs> from my perspective, it was a, a, a knee dislocation. It was a four hours and something that uh, had a ACL, PCL, post arterial corner, post medial corner, patellar tendon tear, uh, medial meniscus, uh, root avulsion, and a tibial fracture. And um, 
you know, we fixed all of that in, in one stage, but uh, it was a, a difficult case just because the nerve on the side was entrapped uh, and in the joint. So we had to, uh, you know, go very, very slow, dissecting the nerve and removing that out of the way and then reconstructing all the ligaments on the side in a, in a patient that was uh, a little bit overweight. So it was a challenging case, but uh, he's doing so well now that it, it was all well, well, well worth it. Yeah, wow. But it, it must have taken a toll because you've got a very good memory of the exact surgery. It sounds like a bloody lot. Yeah, you know, those are the ones that uh, stick to your brain and and you remember every time. But uh, it's when you when you see how gratifying it is when they are go back to walking after they were told they may not be able to walk again. Um, that's that's why we do what we do. You know, it makes you it makes you feel so good about that about that and, and having potentially helped a little bit in, in, in that patient's recovery. It's a, it's very gratifying and it's a it's a blessing that we have. Yeah, incredibly rewarding. For the the athletes and, and sporting people that, that you manage, what what challenges do you typically face when you're treating them, you know, mid season or, or coming into finals and things like that? I think it's challenging because you can't you have to think about what is the least that you can do to keep them playing. So mm-hmm. it's uh, certainly considerations about potentially surgery or, or anything that will keep them, you know, without being able to play. So uh, in, your, in your mind, there's always that those those questions about what is the least that I can do to get them better, and what will endure the loads that uh, that that uh, patient, in this case an athlete, needs to endure. Right. So um, you always think about that. You're always very sensitive of the fact that some of your decisions may impact uh, the season, the team, and the player it's, it himself. So just need to be conscious and careful about what you discuss with him and, and keep him as a part of the decision-making. You, you can always say, these are the three options. You know, this will do this for you, but this is the time that you'll have to be out of it. And um, let them decide as well. You know, I think those uh, decisions that are made with the patient are always the best because they are they can buy into the process, they understand the options, they know why they chose what they chose. So I, I think just making them part of the decision making is important. Yeah, yeah, I certainly agree. We'll we'll finish up with, with one last question, which was an, another lovely listener question. They wanted to know and kind of sporting population and non-sporting population, the the most common injury that you're seeing in the hip and the knee and then the most common surgery that you're performing, which you briefly touched on before, but more specifically. And the hip, uh, for sure, femoral acetabular impingement and labral tears. Uh, and that's probably 40% of my practice. And then knees, uh, I have a third referral practice, so I, I usually see a, a fair amount of complex knee injuries and multi-ligament injuries, but I would say ligamentous injuries are potentially one of the, the most, you know, ligamentous and meniscus, are potentially one of the most common surgeries that I do as well. Yeah. Do you find that the surgical outcomes for meniscus injuries are generally pretty good? Yeah. It depends on, on what meniscus there is. You know, there's a, a recent top surgeon, or at least we've started diagnosing more root tears, which is a detachment of the meniscus. And even in the older population, you know, 50s, 60s, uh, the outcomes can be quite as good, you know, over 90% success rate. And uh, we just completed a study looking at people less than 60 and over 60 that had that type of tear, and uh, the outcomes were no different. So as long as the cartilage uh, surface is okay, I think repairing it does make sense. Yeah, yeah. All right, mate, thank you so much for for coming on. I know that you've got to run. Very, very busy person, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on and answering, especially lots of listener questions, but all those lovely questions. What's on for the rest of the week? Where are you off to? Well, um, we have a clinic today, so um, thank you very much for having me today. It's It's been a pleasure and, and really fun to talk to you. I hope that um, I've got some more new friends in uh, Australia. We were just in Singapore th- uh, two weeks ago, um, giving a course to Australian surgeons, and uh, we had a lot, lot of fun. You know, it's uh, one of my favorite countries in the world. So uh, kudos to your podcast. It's uh, phenomenal, and uh, hope to see you guys soon. Yeah, beautiful, mate. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Bye-bye.